Welcome to the overview of the executive branch and the presidency. Now, please note there are four videos for this chapter because it is such a chapter of great importance. Um, we have divided it up into four parts. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk to you about in this video is the roles and powers of the president. In part two, we'll cover the electoral college. In part three, we'll cover all the president's staff. Who helps the president? This includes White House staff, executive office of the president, cabinet members, and uh, members of other departments and agencies within the government bureaucracy. And then in part four, we'll look at the checks on the president and the expansion of presidential power uh, that we've seen over time. So uh, stay tuned for uh, those videos and uh, check out those links as well. I think this will, will help you in terms of getting your head around uh, all of the content in this chapter. So what do you think? Who's the best president in in U.S. history. Uh, we have different qualifications and categories for uh, choosing a president. Uh, we've seen every pollster from Gallup to Pew to um, all of, the, uh, all of the, the great ones out there look at the idea of a president and, and who's the best. What qualities define that person? Uh, what did they do that, that made them presidential and, and made them one of the best of all time? There's only 45 of them, soon to be 46, and um, the idea here is what, um, what makes a great president? What qualities does a president look for as they're coming into office and um, the importance of, of the role that they play and the impact that they have? So how well do you know your executive branch? You can pause here and take a look at these questions. I won't um, go through each one of these, but it's important to know that at the end of this chapter, you should be able to address all of these questions in terms of what you know and what you've learned about the executive branch. If you can't, uh, then it's time to go back and take a look at, at more of the content that you see here. We're going to start with the roles and powers of the presidency. In the course exam description, this is known as 2.4, uh, the idea of the roles and, and uh, explaining how the president implements um, powers that they have and performs the functions of the office uh, based on the policy agenda. And this is in line with the APUS Government and Politics course exam description uh, that is outlined by the College Board. So uh, following that in terms of uh, the content that you're going to see here today. Let's talk about exclusive powers. Uh, this is power that only belongs to the president. Um, foremost, we see Commander-in-Chief. This is a formal role uh, that the president has. It is outlined in the Constitution as a formal power. And the idea of sending officers or commissioning uh, armed forces and sending them uh, out into um, into battle, but also into humanitarian efforts, such as uh, in droughts or in uh, times of, of earth devastating earthquakes, natural disasters, that sort of thing. Um, the president can also grant pardons. We've seen this done over time, uh, commuting sentences, granting full and free pardons, and um, and weighing the options of whether or not to do that. We've seen uh, that done in many cases. We've seen that decided not to be done in some cases. Uh, the president also has the sole power to call Congress back into session. Uh, Harry Truman did this in the uh, the do-nothing Congress era, where he said, uh, you need to come back and, and get to work. We've got, we've got work to do for the American people here. Uh, the president also is on behalf of the United States government receiving ambassadors. Now the Speaker of the House does this, the Majority Leader in the Senate does this, but in terms of being able to speak on behalf of a nation, uh, it is uh, the President that has that role to receive those ambassadors, to hold state dinners, uh, to hold those uh, very important diplomatic conferences and discussions uh, with the diplomatic leaders of other nations in order to uh, arrive at a, a an executive agreement, a trade agreement, or uh, or at most a treaty uh, that would then need to be ratified by the Senate. And then lastly, uh, the importance of presidential power always stems from uh, the information given to the American people, and this is uh, a requirement of the Constitution. Article two of the Constitution says that the president must inform uh, the Congress on the State of the Union on an annual basis. Now it doesn't have to be delivered in person, and it doesn't have to be delivered audibly. Uh, it can be written. Written. Thomas Jefferson did that, submitted his in writing. He thought Congress was uh, the, the uh, dominant branch of government. So he uh, saw the presidential role as being uh, one in which uh, that would be submitted in writing uh, to Congress. FDR submitted in writing during the during wartime. He didn't want uh, us to look like we were having a party in the, in the Capitol while uh, we had troops overseas fighting wars and dying. Uh, so uh, this has been done in different ways over, over different media and 
and time. Uh, but we have seen uh, traditionally over the last 40, 50 years uh, that we the uh, presidents have given that uh, audibly in the uh, well of the House, uh, speaking from the um, from the dais of the uh, of the House chamber uh, to a, a a joint session of Congress, uh, and that is the role that um, the the State of the Union has played in terms of informing the Congress on the state of our union. Now there are shared powers within the U.S. Senate uh, that are very important to point out here. Uh, the President alone uh, doesn't uh, have appointment power. Remember that is shared with the Senate. The President would nominate uh, someone to sit in the uh, cabinet uh, as a uh, head of a department or an agency uh, or a, a government. Um, corporation, uh, such as the U.S. Postal Service or the, um, uh, uh, the Amtrak. Um, and so as a result of this, the uh, Senate confirms those nominees to head those agencies or to head those departments. Uh, judicial nominees to, uh, to sit on the federal bench, uh, a judge uh, on the federal circuit, which is beneath the Supreme Court, um, the president nominates those judges. Uh, president Trump has nominated over 200 of those judges. One in six on the federal judiciary today is a Trump appointee. And those are confirmed by the Senate, now with just a majority vote. Uh, we've seen justices to the Supreme Court, three of them coming from uh, the, the Trump appointments uh, over the last four years. And we saw two of those in the Obama years. Uh, we saw two of those in the uh, George W. Bush years. Uh, so we can see seven of the nine have come from the last three uh, presidents, from the last three administrations. And so you can see the significant power uh, that the appointment has has in terms of presidential politics and in terms of longevity. Uh, these appointments are going to last a lot longer than the presidency will, uh, a lot longer than the, the Bush administration or the Obama administration. Those justices will be there. They serve for life. And so uh, their, their uh, ability to influence will continue to live on well beyond uh, a presidency. Uh, but the Senate does have that advice and consent role. He shares, uh, the president shares that uh, with the U.S. Senate. Also, making treaties is an important role. Uh, Woodrow Wilson brought back the League of Nations. It was rejected by the Senate. It ultimately um, led to a, a breakdown in um, in trying to figure out uh, how Germany should pay for uh, the First World War, which uh, led to a depression and and the rise uh, of Hitler. And and uh, and many people say it led to uh, what be what became World War II uh, as a result of uh, the breakdown in talks on the League of Nations. So um, these these ratifications or rejections have a significant impact on history, have a significant impact on uh, tomorrow's history uh, in terms of what's happening here. So the, the role of treaties is really important here as well. Now with Congress, uh, the president shares uh, some legislative ability uh, because remember, uh, while the president doesn't have the power of line item veto, which I'll talk about in a second, um, the president does have the power to sign legislation, signing statements, very powerful. Uh, I'm signing this bill today in the Rose Garden because uh, I think it's important for the American people. I think this is going to help, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's approving legislation. They're sign making a signing statement. Uh, they're having a ceremony in the Rose Garden or in the Oval Office or something like that. Um, and they're approving the legislation. They're, they're getting it through. It's the bill has become a law. Uh, now, the president can also veto the power to say no. Uh, the president can say no and uh, doesn't necessarily have to give a reason, uh, but many times those veto statements do have some impact. I'm vetoing this today because I, can, I think it can be a better bill. I think that Congress needs to go back to work and find ways to um, do a better job in shoring this up and making this bill better. And so that power of veto uh, really is influential in shaping the bill to be a better bill for the American people down the road, we hope. Uh, Congress can override that veto. Remember, only 4% of those actually survive the, the, the uh, veto. 96% um, of them are never overridden. Uh, you, you'd never get to that two-thirds vote because you need both houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, to override uh, that presidential veto. And uh, obviously, that's a huge hurdle. Uh, it's hard enough to get a majority to agree, let alone two-thirds. And then the last one is the pocket veto. Uh, we talked about this in the legislative process, but really important here to point out uh, the role of the pocket veto in terms of the president uh, can basically let the bill sit on the desk and for 10 business days, not counting Sundays, uh, for 10 business days, if uh, it sits there and Congress is still in session, the bill becomes law. Why would the president do that? Uh, well, the president would do that if 
he didn't want to be associated with a bill that he wanted to see become law, but didn't necessarily want to have a hand in it because he was worried that uh, something could go wrong with it and then he would get the blame. Okay, so uh, that would be a reason why the president would, would take a step back. Now, likewise, uh, if the bill sits on the desk for 10 days and all of a sudden Congress is out of session for some reason, then the bill would die. Uh, and why would the president not just veto the bill and be done with it? Uh, well, again, uh, the president doesn't necessarily want to be associated with sabotaging the bill, uh, so he's going to let it sit there. And um, maybe it's a very popular bill. He doesn't want to be he doesn't want it to go into law, but he doesn't want to be associated with with uh, s signing the veto that basically you know put the put the stake through the heart of the bill. Uh, so a pocket veto. Vito is able to do that. He's not able to, to claim he did anything. Uh, I just let it sit there. It died. Congress was out of session. What could I do, right? Um, and so the bill dies in that particular sense. When Congress is out of session, after 10 uh, business days, not counting Sundays, uh, the bill would die on the president's desk. So uh, that is a role and, and about the only one that the president plays in terms of uh, sharing that legislative, that lawmaking power with Congress. Now, um, that doesn't mean that the president can't shape the agenda. The president as chief legislator, uh, which we talked about in the roles, which we'll talk about in a minute, the president as chief legislator can uh, take that and, and, and really use the bully pulpit, his power of talking to the media and getting them to pay attention, and can talk about issues to prioritize what's important and get Congress to pay attention. Hey, the president's been talking about this and really talking and talking about this. Um, maybe we need to, uh, to get some legislation up there uh, so that he'll, he'll sign it and go move on to something else. Uh, so that's a really important role, and that's probably about it in terms of uh, the role that he plays in that process. Now, he has people that will help in, in as liaisons uh, to help in, in drafting that and kind of shepherding it through Congress um, with, uh, with the leadership in, in the House and Senate. Uh, but, but essentially, in terms of the actual lawmaking process and a, a, an official role in that capacity, the president uh, doesn't. Uh, the line item veto is, is, a, is as close as we have come uh, to having that type of power. And the Supreme Court, you know, uh, not to put, you know, put the end of the story before we get to the beginning, but uh, the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional, okay, for a president. So uh, let's go back a little bit. Um, presidents have been clamoring for this line item veto for a long time. Well, first of all, what is it? A line item veto is basically taking a bill, and uh, instead of vetoing the whole thing, I just veto the lines I don't like, uh, the lines or the sentences or the paragraphs that I don't like as president, and I can veto those particular pieces. Um, President uh, Ronald Reagan mentioned this uh, back in the 80s and said, I'd really like a line item veto. President George Herbert Walker Bush, after Reagan, said the same thing. Give me the line item veto, Congress. Give me the power of the line item veto. Um, Bill Clinton came along and he said, I was a governor in Arkansas and I had line item veto power and it worked really effectively. Give it to me here as president. And they finally did. They actually gave him the power of line item veto. Uh, the city of New York actually sued the Clinton administration uh, saying that they didn't have uh, that power because it was basically usurping the power of lawmaking, which is Congress's job. And the Supreme Court agreed. In the Clinton v. City of New York case in 1998, uh, the Supreme Court said that is unconstitutional. Governors can have it uh, in state constitutions because it doesn't violate the U.S. Constitution. Uh, they're doing what they need to in their own state, and, and that is their purview. But when it comes to the Constitution itself, Article 1 is all about the legislative branch making laws. And by giving the president, under Article 2, uh, in the executive branch, the power to um, edit and, and adjust the lawmaking process, you have given too much power to the executive branch and it violates separation of powers. It violates that separation of power between Article 1, the legislative, and Article 2, the executive branches. So um, after all that clamoring and after decades of, of asking for the line item veto, Supreme Court stepped in and said it's unconstitutional anyway. Uh, so that was the closest the president has ever come to, to getting law making authority and uh, the president has it no longer. Now, full uh, full stop, the um the idea here is that the governors still have that ability uh, to line item veto, and that is constitutional. That has a, a, uh, been upheld uh, under constitutional scrutiny by the Supreme Court uh, because 
of, of um, them being governed by state constitutions and not by the U.S. Constitution. So that's kind of how they've gotten around that, what we call statutory construction. State statutes and, and state constitutions varying very differently from the U.S. Constitution, as long as it doesn't violate uh, what we talk about in the U.S. Constitution. And again, remember, Article 1 and Article 2, just like Article 3, are very enumerated powers. They're spelled out in terms of the powers that the government has. And in Article 1, the Supreme Court said it is clear that the uh, legislative branch has lawmaking authority. In Article 2, the president does not. It is about enforcement. It is about carrying out the law. Okay, so let's talk about presidential qualifications. So uh, in order to be president, uh, the Constitution says you have to be 35 years of age. You need to be a resident of the United States for 14 years, and that can include places like uh, serving in an embassy or serving uh, in the military where you're being you know, sent, stationed somewhere else. That would count, as well as um, if you are, are on a, pre a U.S. territory uh, or, or a possession of the United States. Uh, so any of those uh, would count for that 14 years. And then the, the most unclear one is natural born citizen. Now, uh, over time, we've, we've come to assume, and again, it's just an assumption, assume that natural born citizen means uh, that you have been born uh, in uh, the United States or in its territories or in a consulate or embassy of the United States, uh, which would be um, uh, U.S. territory as it is. Uh, so, but, but that's never really been tested. So uh, the idea there is uh, those are kind of the qualifications formally uh, that we have seen. But other than that, uh, not a whole lot else. And, uh, and everybody's kind of fallen in line pretty much with uh, what we've seen there. Now, informally, uh, very different. Uh, we noticed that they are male. Um, Hillary Clinton came the closest to breaking that glass ceiling. And, and that uh, has uh, not been broken. So uh, they are male. Uh, other than Barack Obama, they're very white. And other than John F. Kennedy and now President-elect uh, Joe Biden, uh, they're Protestant. Uh, uh, Kennedy was Catholic and Biden is Catholic as well. Uh, but otherwise, they've been white, male, and Protestant, other than those three exceptions uh, being, um, like I said, uh, Barack Obama, um, uh, John F. Kennedy, and, uh, and President-elect Biden. Uh, all of the others have been white, male, and Protestant. Uh, so is that changing? Well, the demographics of the country are changing. We know this. Uh, we have, um, in terms of uh, urban centers, we have more majority minority populations. Uh, the eth race and ethnicity of the country is changing, and we're seeing that in, um, in places that are gaining in electoral votes, such as Texas and Florida and California and Arizona. Uh, so that is changing the makeup uh, of the informal powers and, um, and how that, that shakes up and, and will, uh, will take shape in the future. Who knows? Um, many of them have served in office before. Now, we know President Trump did not. He was a, a businessman uh, out of New York City and had business all around the world, um, which uh, many people seem to like in terms of that, that business expertise. Um, many of them have been governors. Uh, many uh, Ronald Reagan was a governor. Bill Clinton was a governor. Many of them have been senators, uh, but, but not as many as have been governors or House members. Uh, senators would include uh, someone like George Herbert Walker Bush, Barack Obama, uh, Joe Biden. Uh, all of them have been, um, have been senators. And then some are House members uh, that have moved up uh, along the way and run as well. And then we have some serving in the military. Uh, we saw Eisenhower, a great example of that. General Washington, uh, the idea of General Washington. Uh, now, they were civilian when taking office uh, because they resigned their commissions. Uh, they aren't military leaders that have taken over. Uh, so there is a distinction there because remember, our government is very civilian oriented. Even the military is run by civilians. Um, and then, um, and then we have some former vice presidents in here as well. So um, those are some of the qualifications. Now, we have just been through an election, uh, 2020 election, and a very close race at that. We've talked a lot about the Electoral College. And again, part two is going to talk in more detail about that. I just want to go through here in terms of how we elect a president very briefly. Uh, I encourage you and urge you to watch uh, the part two video on the Electoral College to get a more in-depth point of view. But essentially, uh, the magic number here is Interstate 270 right off of the highway here from Walter Johnson High School. We have uh, 270, and that's the road you need to take to get down to the American Legion Bridge, to get on GW Parkway, to get to Constitution Avenue, to get to the White House. So uh, in long story short, uh, you need 270 electoral votes. You need to get on Interstate 270, and it's a great way to remember it. 270 is one more than half. Uh, the number of uh, the electoral votes that are in the Electoral College are 538. 
Uh, if you divide that by 2, you get 269. And in order to get a majority, I need one more than half, so that would be 270. And that's why 270 is the magic number. Now, originally, uh, whoever got the most votes in the Electoral College became president, and whoever got the second highest number would become vice president. Now, as we saw uh, in, in 1796, uh, this became uh, a bit of a kerfuffle uh, because John Adams won, and uh, Thomas Jefferson came in second uh, with the second highest number of votes, and um, they were of very different ideologies in terms of their approach to government and governing. Uh, and so it made for a very contentious four years, and then uh, Thomas Jefferson would go on to win the presidency in the next uh, electoral college and become president and serve for two four-year terms, uh, stepping down just like Washington did after two four-year terms. Um, now, the 12th Amendment would change that and basically separate the ballots, which would make it uh, clearer in terms of who, who in the Electoral College is voting for president and voting for vice president. So then they ran basically as a ticket under the 12th Amendment. So uh, that basically gave them uh, the, the idea of, of running together. So now we vote for a president and a vice president oh, when, when really we're voting for the electors behind that president and vice president. Now, the Electoral College is choosing that it is, it is not the American people. We love to think we're going in and voting for them, but we're really voting for the electors behind those candidates. So if you're voting for the Republican candidate, you're voting for the electors representing the Republican in that state. Uh, if you're voting Democratic, you are voting uh, for the electors uh, representing the Democratic candidate in that state. And so those electors on December 14th will go to their respective state capitals and cast their votes, and thus um, 270 are what are needed. They'll then uh, certify those votes. They'll send them to Washington, uh, to the Senate, in fact, and the vice president, uh, as presiding officer of the Senate, uh, will open those and will count the votes in January. January, and they will uh, certify who is the who in fact is the winner of the Electoral College as a result of this. Now the president serves a four-year term. We know that uh, due to the 22nd Amendment, they can run uh, for an additional term of four years. And um, if they came in midstream to, uh, uh, for example, like when Kennedy was assassinated, Johnson came in in 63, um, it wouldn't have been a, a full term. So he could have run for two full terms. Uh, he only ended up running for one because of Vietnam, uh, but he could have served 10 years uh, in that capacity because of him coming in early. So I go into much more detail on this in part two of the Electoral College, and I would encourage you to watch that one as well as the other two. I think you'll, you'll find them helpful. But uh, let's transition from the 22nd Amendment to the 25th Amendment, looking at succession. The idea of how did, um, how did these people get here in some cases, uh, we look at the presidential line of succession. And this is that if something were to happen to the president, uh, then it would be the vice president that would be become president. And if something happened to the president and the vice president, next in line would be the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Um, and if something were to happen to the president, vice president, and Speaker of the House, and again, they're thinking of this in times of the Cold War, nuclear um, proliferation, and uh, basically nuclear war a hundred times over that's going to kill all of us, uh, whoever survives essentially becomes uh, the president. And in this case, uh, after the Speaker would be the president pro tempore, uh, of the Senate, which would be Charles Grassley, Chuck Grassley from Iowa. Um, he is the oldest serving member of the majority party uh, at the time. And so he would be serving. Uh, and uh, and as it looks right now, with the Republicans holding the majority in the Senate, that will not change. So it would be Chuck Grassley. Uh, they were thinking it might be it might be Democratic, so it would move to Pat Leahy uh, from Vermont uh, that is the uh, longest-serving member of the Democratic Party, but it doesn't look like uh, that may happen. It depends on those special elections in Georgia. So stay tuned. We'll see what happens there. Uh, if all four of them uh, are incapacitated and unable to serve, uh, then it would move to the Secretary of State, which is Mike Pompeo, and then it moves down to the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Defense, uh, the Attorney General, and so on and so forth. Uh, I always tell students the easy way to remember that which amendment this is is because the succession line is about 25 long. It's really more than that, but, but the idea is it's about 25 long. 
uh, and that is coming from the 25th Amendment in terms of what we see there. Now, what happens if the president is disabled but not dead, okay? Uh, and I know this is kind of morbid to be talking like this, but you got to account for every what-if kind of scenario uh, when you're the president of the United States and when you're, uh, when you're trying to make sure that succession is covered, especially during nuclear war times. So the 25th Amendment says um, that the vice president uh, would serve as acting president if the president is disabled. Now, how do we know if the president is actually disabled? Now, the president could say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be going under anesthesia and uh, I'm going to turn over the, the presidency to the vice president. Uh, George W. Bush did this when uh, he had surgery. Uh, he had some elective surgery done and uh, he went under anesthesia uh, and they, they basically put him out. And so he signed over the presidency to Dick Cheney uh, while he did that. Um, and that was for, uh, I don't even know, like 20 hours or so. And then uh, he was able to resume uh, the the um, uh, the decisions the decision making power of the of the presidency as a result of that. Uh, but if the president is unable to do that to declare themselves disabled, um, and this is where it gets a little dicier. But uh, the vice president and a majority of the cabinet could decide that uh, if the president um, doesn't agree with them in terms of the vice president and the majority of the cabinet looking at them going, hey, um, you're disabled here. We, we need the vice president to step up. Um, if the president disagrees, Congress then can step in. But again, you need two thirds of the vote in order to um, in order to move uh, succession to the vice president, even temporarily in that capacity. Okay, if the uh, president is disabled but not dead, uh, that's uh, essentially what we would see there. The vice president would serve as acting president. Um, we saw some of this happening uh, when Wilson had a stroke, when Garfield was disabled, when he was shot. Um, and I, as I mentioned, uh, Dick Cheney there uh, when, when Bush was, was having surgery. Um, the idea here is the same. You... Um, you need uh, the vice president and a majority of the cabinet, or you need uh, two thirds of Congress uh, if if the the president doesn't go along. Uh, and uh, in the case of Bush, uh, that was a very it was a very procedural method. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of drama there because um, they were a ticket when they ran and they worked together in that capacity. So not a whole lot of uh, drama taking place. Uh, the vice president, as we talked about in the legislative. Uh, chapter, uh, presides over the Senate. Uh, he would cast the tie-breaking vote. This is Mike Pence. You can see him there in the uh, uh, the uh, upper, the uh, uh, shot at the top. Um, he's presiding over the Senate, and it uh, looks like there is a tie. He's going to break the vote there, and he votes yes uh, to break that tie in terms of uh, repealing um, one of the uh, Health and Human Services uh, rules on family planning. Um, the uh, the idea here is uh, in the tie-breaking vote. That's essentially uh, the role that he plays in the in the Senate. Uh, the only other one will be when he goes in um, in January to uh, certify the electoral votes and to basically uh, count them up and and make sure that they're accurate. That sort of thing. Um, the uh, the most important one is really uh, standing in the wings so that if the president is incapacitated, he can take over. Uh, and finish the term. Uh, and again, the president really is the determining factor here because the president decides how much or how little do I give the vice president. So uh, Lyndon Johnson was very frustrated with the vice presidency. He really didn't feel it uh, as a very, uh, um, a, a very, um, uh, enamored role that he was playing in that. He was a, he came from the Senate majority uh, where he was the majority leader and uh, really liked, you know, the, the power and the, the, um, the, the vote wielding and the negotiation and all the processes around that. He became vice president and uh, it was much less thrilling for him. It wasn't nearly um, what I probably think he probably thought it might be. Uh, and so that was, um, that was very different for him. And, and there's some, uh, a really good biography, um, that um, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin did on him that I, if you're ever interested and want to read on that, it's really good about his presidency. She uh, basically followed him around after his presidency and talked with him and interviewed him for like, I don't know, four or six months um, in terms of uh, getting information on that. And it, it's really fascinating. At any rate, we go to Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1 of the Vesting Clause of the Constitution, uh, which is where the president gets his power. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. This isn't a king. This isn't a minister plenipotentiary. This is a president of the United States, POTUS.
Okay, uh, POTUS, President of the United States, uh, and that's where we get the uh, the term POTUS. Uh, POTUS, excuse me. Uh, FLOTUS would be the uh, the First Lady of the United States. V POTUS, uh, Vice President of the United States, and. Um, the presidents usually use this vesting clause to do, uh, well, in a lot of cases, whatever they want. Uh, and and so uh, they're like, what are you going to do, impeach me? Okay, well, maybe they do. Uh, we saw that with Bill Clinton. Uh, we saw that with Andrew Johnson. We saw that with President Trump. Um, and um, and like the Energizer Bunny, they keep going, right? Uh, so uh, we see uh, them take enormous power under the vesting clause, uh, but they uh, they are limited because remember checks and balances, uh, the power to enforce the law, but you can't make the law, and um, that is Congress's job. So uh, with the federal bureaucracy, uh, they are in charge of uh, uh, proposing a budget. Now Congress is going to take a whack at that, uh, like nobody's business. Think a weed whacker uh, to two and a half trillion dollars a year. Uh, when you're dealing with 4 million employees, 2 million on the payroll, 2 million uh, within the government bureaucracy, 2 million usually as contractors and that sort of thing. And then you have about 3,000 plum jobs. Uh, these are the uh, the, the plum uh, book uh, jobs uh, that, that are the best of the best uh, presidential appointment. Uh, the Biden uh, transition team is looking at these jobs right now in terms of who's going to fill them uh, and, and the role that they will play. Uh, they just named the... Um, uh, he just named Ron Klain the uh, chief of staff for the White House. Is going to oversee all of the uh, the choosing of all of the other offices. Uh, so that's a really important role that they play there. And we see this playing out. Uh, through the executive branch, uh, the bureaucracy, you see all the departments here, all the different agencies and independent departments, uh, regulatory agencies, government corporations, all of that here. All of that overseen, notice, it's all uh, leading up to the executive branch. Notice the legislative branch, 535 people, yeah, they have staffs, but then that's it. Uh, judicial branch, okay, nine justices, okay, you've got, you know, 400 uh, judges on the bench in the federal judiciary, and then that's it. Uh, the, the real bulk of the government really comes comes under the executive branch, and that's why the presidency is so important uh, for a party's ideology in terms of winning it, because it really is the role that they play there in terms of carrying out the agenda of the party. So let's talk about those roles. Um, I want to talk about the roles, and uh, let's start with the first three, because these are the formal roles of the president. Now, uh, these are the ones, when we say formal, we, we mean that they are in the Constitution. They are actually in Article 2 of the Constitution saying what the president uh, is supposed to do here. The president serves as commander-in-chief. Now, we know that the Congress declares war, but we know that the president, as, as commander-in-chief, is going to send troops. Um, he may send troops into war. He may send troops into um, uh, lines of action to prevent war, uh, to keep the peace. Uh, to help in humanitarian missions, such as during an earthquake or a tsunami or um, some type of natural disasters. Uh, that is the role of the commander-in-chief, is really to oversee the military. And it's important that the framers uh, really saw that as a civilian role over the military, not a military role over the military. Uh, because they wanted a civilian uh, looking at the overarching factors of all of, of the United States and what's best for the American people as a whole in terms of sending troops. Um, Diplomat-in-chief is this idea of uh, negotiating with other countries and their diplomats, um, having those at the State Department working with those in, in, uh, in embassies and consulates uh, in Washington, uh, representing other countries like China and Russia and uh, Japan and, and uh, Mexico and Canada and so on and so forth. Um, but, um, but that's really where the work gets done. If you're going to come up with a treaty or an executive agreement or a trade policy, uh, it's going to be done in those meetings. It's going to be done as part of the role of, uh, that the president has in diplomat-in-chief. And, and really the president uh, is outlined by the framers as having that power. And then the last one is administrator-in-chief. And this is really the role of, of overseeing the bureaucracy, the day-to-day -day operations of the government in terms of the role that the president plays here. So uh, what we see are these three roles in the middle, uh, the in-chief roles, are the formal ones. The ones at the top, the ones at the bottom, those are informal roles. So um, in looking at administrator-in-chief, again, overseeing the bureaucracy, commander-in-chief, uh, heading the armed forces, sending in troops where needed, and then diplomat-in-chief in terms of working with other nations uh, to come up with agreements and, um, and, and improve relations with those countries and the United States. Now, let's look at the informal roles. These are ones that are not in the Constitution, but they have evolved over time 
to become uh, roles that the president plays because he is de facto uh, the person in charge uh, in terms of, of so much of government, and therefore this really falls on his shoulders. Uh, the first one is chief economic planner. Who better to create jobs uh, than someone who is proposing to Congress uh, the policy agenda, the priorities of what Congress needs to do in order to pass legislation that helps the American people? Uh, during the coronavirus, COVID-19 epidemic, uh, the global pandemic, excuse me, um, many people are suffering. And and so um, the coronavirus uh, stimulus was designed to help people, but it ran out in July. So here we are in November, and people, uh, many people are still saying, you know, they're, they're struggling. They're having uh, a really hard time. And unemployment has fallen, but, um, but uh, is still not what it was before the, uh, before the pandemic. And we have um, millions more people that have, been, have gotten, um, had tested positive for it, uh, and many of them hospitalized. So um, we have a lot going on there, and that impacts jobs. So Chief Economic Planner is all about creating jobs. How do we promote uh, a policy agenda to Congress in order to help create jobs and get people back to work? If people are back to work, they're paying their mortgage. Uh, they're buying their kids things. They're taking their kids out to movies and dinner. Um, they're going on vacations. They're spending money. That's contributing to the economy that is in turn creating even more jobs. And so that's really important that the president play that role as a chief economic planner or guardian of the economy. I've seen it done that way too. They're guarding the economy. Who better to guard the economy than the president in terms of helping to create those jobs? Because if it goes south and, and many jobs are lost, you, I guarantee you the president is going to be the one who gets blamed. Uh, political party leader is the next one here we see in the red box. And this is the role that uh, anybody who rises to the level of president um, is de facto political party leader. Um, we saw this with President Obama going out and speaking uh, to many any Senate races and uh, and in the presidential race for uh, the Biden-Harris ticket, uh, he is de facto the political party leader for the Democrats. Uh, President Trump is the de facto leader, political party leader for the Republicans. And this is because who better to raise money and to get people uh, out to support your candidate and your causes than uh, the person who is your political party leader, uh, the person who can raise the most money and get people out to vote and can really get people to rally around your candidate uh, it's the political party leader that's going to do that. And so they get them to record robocalls, to record commercials, uh, to go to rubber chicken dinners and uh, shake hands, kiss babies, and and call for your support. Get out your checkbooks and write a check to this Senate candidate because they need your help, okay? Uh, and they do that through phones. They do that through email. They do that through um, those those dinners. Uh, not as many of them during the, the pandemic, uh, but the idea there is the same. Now we go down to the lower left-hand corner of chief legislature. Later. This kind of tied into the guardian of the economy I was talking about. But as chief legislator, your job here is to really promote the agenda that you want to accomplish. So you're talking to Congress through the media in a lot of cases. That's using the bully pulpit, what we call the bully pulpit. The idea is you get up there to speak at the at the podium, and because you are the president, you are commanding an audience, and uh, the media pay attention when you speak. And so when you talk about an issue, all of a sudden it becomes one of the most important issues that's on the evening news. You're changing the agenda, uh, and that chief legislator role is really Really that. The president talks about um, uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, has the uh, the task force in the uh, in the press briefing room of the White House. Uh, people air that live. They pay attention. They're looking at it. When uh, President-elect Biden announced his transition uh, team for the for the coronavirus task force, uh, that was all over the news on on Monday night and into Tuesday morning. Why? Because uh, people are paying attention to what the president has to say, and that also means the president-elect. Uh, and so they're looking at that and saying, "Wow, th this is uh, this is a changing the game." How is this similar or different to uh, the way President Trump was handling this? And they look at all of those issues and they're analyzing it uh, for the American people and they're putting it out there. Uh, that is the role of chief legislator, to really set the agenda and set the agenda for Congress. This is what you should be working on. State of the Union, I guarantee you, every State of the Union talks about what the president wants Congress to accomplish. Now, whether they want to accomplish it or not, well, that's up to them. But the idea is uh, the president sets that tone. And then the last one is head of state, and it's very ceremonial, really ties into diplomat in chief, but we kind of leave it as a, as a separate item because these are more the ceremonial roles. Uh, when someone gets married uh, from an, uh, in another country that is a head of state, uh, for instance, 
Prince Harry uh, when he married uh, Meghan. Uh, the uh, the idea there was uh, someone was invited, uh, the pr the president was invited to uh, to attend, and uh, the president didn't go, but the president sent someone on his behalf uh, that that went uh, to that that engagement. Um, the same is true when a head of state passes away when they die uh, in another country. Uh, the president is invited to that funeral, and someone goes on behalf of the president. Sometimes it is the president. Uh, when Princess Diana died, um, the president was invited. It was President Clinton at the time. And uh, the president didn't go, but Hil the first lady did. Uh, the first lady, Hillary Clinton, went uh, on behalf of the president uh, to show respect uh, for goodwill, um, especially with allies um, and uh, Britain being a very close ally of the United States. Um, that was a very important role. That was a head of state role. It wasn't a diplomat in chief. They didn't go in and talk about any treaties or, or uh, uh, executive agreements or any, anything like that, any trade agreements or whatnot. But it, it really sh is goodwill, and it shows uh, the, the uh, confidence that the other country has uh, that they would send their leaders um, to share their condolences. And so that is a very ceremonial role, but nonetheless a very important one. So I mentioned Commander-in-Chief. I'm just going to go hit these uh, briefly, and you can always pause this to, to read it in more detail. But uh, the role in Commander-in-Chief here is uh, the president is overseeing foreign affairs. So um, again, the constitutional framers wanted uh, the military to be under the hands of a civilian, didn't want military officers. Uh, that is why George Washington resigned his commission long before uh, the Electoral College elected him unanimously. Uh, as president of the United States. He was a civilian. He was uh, an average citizen at that point, uh, never uh, being an average citizen, of course, being the, the father of our nation. But uh, but the idea is uh, they wanted the military to be under civilian control, not under military control. So um, so we see a lot of that in terms of the president being having the ability to um, uh, send troops to uh, to help out um, in, in uh, natural disaster types of situations. The chief diplomat role, again, to negotiate treaties, um, to work on executive agreements. Trade agreements is probably the most popular one here. Um, in an executive agreement, you don't need the Senate's approval. So uh, this is a lot easier to get. Uh, now, it doesn't go past the president's term. Uh, so once uh, you, the agreement is signed, it is for the life of the president's term, and then it would expire, unlike a treaty that uh, could go on forever. It depends on the, the terms of the treaty. Um, but those are very different there. And that gives uh, an executive agreement gives the president a lot of power, uh, at least during his term, uh, to really set the, the, uh, the rules, set the parameters of dealing with other nations. Um, and we have seen this time and again in terms of uh, using it to shape foreign policy and to um, persuade not just Congress, but the public in terms of uh, what um, they want to accomplish and how they can do so. Now, some informal powers uh, that I mentioned in terms of foreign policy that we see here, uh, things like executive agreements, uh, and that's probably the most common, but you know, sitting down and meeting with world leaders, setting the agenda, dealing with crises. Uh, we see him sitting down here uh, at the G7 uh, some of the, the global uh, leaders of the seven uh, largest nations. And then um, we see him sitting down with Kim Jong-un uh, from North Korea. Uh, we see him sitting down with Angela Merkel uh, from Germany. Uh, these are all roles that the president plays. Uh, and, and head of state is a part of this very informal power in terms of these meetings. Um, it may not necessarily uh, lead to a, a discussion right there or some type of a formal agreement or a treaty for that matter. That's more the diplomat in chief role. Uh, that many diplomats working on behalf of the president, usually from the State Department or in embassies around the world, uh, that will do that on behalf of the president more in the formal power than the informal power. Uh, but these basically set the stage for those formal powers to be instituted. Without the informal powers, you don't have the ability to sit down with nations. If you're not going uh, to these other nations and meeting with world leaders, it's very hard uh, for you to get them in the room in order to conduct uh, an, an, an agreement to a point that you get a treaty, that you get a trade agreement on the table. Uh, so we can see all of that kind of playing out. Uh, don't kid yourself, the power of appointment here, as we talked about, is very very important. Um, the president appoints 
uh, people to positions of authority in the cabinet, of course, and those would stay with the president and they serve at the pleasure of the president. But beyond that, uh, we have ambassadors uh, that serve around the world in embassies uh, that will serve at the, at the pleasure of the president in those capacities, carrying out uh, the government's business around the world in those particular countries where they've been assigned. But judges are really critical here because, again, they serve for life. So uh, long after the Trump administration is gone, uh, judges like Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett will continue uh, to to serve out their terms because they have lifetime appointments. So they'll continue to work uh, in carrying out the president's ideology long after, long after the president's term is up. Uh, you think about Clarence Thomas. He was appointed by George Herbert Walker Bush. Well, George Herbert Walker Bush hasn't been in office in almost, what, 28 years, almost 30 years uh, that the president hasn't been in the White House. Uh, but Clarence Thomas is still on the court, is still uh, voting on decisions uh, that those nine justices make on the court. And that has an impact uh, in terms of uh, the, the legacy of a uh, of a Bush administration, of a Trump administration, of an Obama administration. Uh, and we see this kind of playing out here in terms of how much power the president has beyond uh, those four years or eight years. Uh, recess appointments are another one that we don't see as much of today uh, because, again, um, mainly the uh, the Congress doesn't recess like they used to. Uh, and, and for this reason, uh, well, for one, uh, the the recess appointment is really the idea that uh, Congress is divided, or, or excuse me, the uh, the White House is of a different uh, political party in terms of the majority uh, than the Senate, uh, because remember the Senate confirms uh, those appointments. And if the Senate is not of the same political party as the president, uh, you're going to have gridlock. You're going to have partisanship. Uh, and so recess appointments are where um, many presidents, Obama, Bush, Clinton, you can see them here on the chart, um, tended to use uh, the recess appointment time when Congress goes to recess to basically make an appointment that is acting and, uh, and basically um, circumvent the uh, Senate's uh, approval process, the Senate's confirmation process. Now, uh, they don't live beyond beyond the, the, uh, the term uh, in office, but the idea here is that they, um, they would be able to serve without getting Senate approval. And uh, we've also seen the president do this in an acting role for many cabinet positions in this administration, uh, more so than we've seen in, in previous administrations, uh, where the president has named acting individuals to serve as the acting secretary of defense or the acting uh, secretary of the interior. Um, Homeland security is an acting role. Um, and that is to get around uh, Senate confirmation, Senate approval. Um, and again, they, they don't uh, go beyond uh, the, the president's term there, or excuse me, the, uh, the session of Congress. Uh, but the idea is the president has someone in that role uh, that they've handpicked, and they never had to go through Senate confirmation in order to do so. Now, let's talk uh, about presidential powers in terms of uh, the, the power of veto here. Uh, this is a role that um, the president uh, values. We talked about the veto versus the pocket veto. Uh, the president can also pardon uh, and, and commute those sentences. Um, and in doing so, the president has power under the Constitution to do that. The president here can also uh, use the take care clause uh, in order to do what they feel is right. Uh, again, their powers under the vesting clause uh, are, are basically give them carte blanche to carry out the law. Uh, so how can they do that? Well, uh, they take care to make sure that the law is faithfully executed. Uh, and, and again, um, so if the vesting clause didn't work for them, then the take care clause will in terms of helping them to take care that the the Constitution is, is fully executed and enforced um, across the country. And so uh, that is a really important role that the president plays in terms of carrying out his policy agenda because how he interprets uh, what's being taken care of in terms of carrying out the law is really important. Um, and we've seen this in, in the illegal immigration discussion. Um, how important is that uh, to Democrats versus Republicans? Uh, they view that issue very differently in terms of the take care clause. And then the last one, the idea of the power to inform, uh, the power to call Congress in, uh, the power to uh, to shape uh, the agenda in terms of telling Congress what they can and cannot do, all has a role there that, that they play. Uh, executive orders are also really important. Now, remember, executive agreements are ones we make with other nations. Executive orders are domestic policies that, again, don't have to go through Congress. So this has the full force of law. 
just like a law, uh, a bill that was going through Congress and became a law, the president can sign an executive order that basically uses his vesting powers, his vesting clause powers, uh, to um, to carry out the law and to do it this way. Uh, president Truman desegregated um, the uh, military uh, in this capacity using an executive order. Um, we saw that uh, FDR uh, uh, issued an order to uh, uh, desegregate um, the um, contractors that were that were working with uh, militaries during the uh, world during World War II. Um, we continue to see this kind of play out in terms of executive orders. We've seen President Obama issue orders saying, "Well, if Congress isn't going to work with me on doing something, then I I have a pen and a phone. I'm going to issue executive orders and and carry things out uh, under the vesting clause the best I can." We've seen President Trump do this with executive orders uh, to pull us out of the Paris Climate Accords uh, was one example. Uh, to uh, it was an executive order uh, to get out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement uh, with uh, the uh, East Asian nations uh, was an executive order that was issued. So they have the full force of law. Um, it definitely conflicts with the Congress's agenda in terms of they'd like uh, to work with the president and the president's staff to do something uh, through Congress, but they don't always get that wish. That's not always uh, possible there. But uh, again, just like a law, a bill becomes a law, can be ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court can also rule an executive order unconstitutional. We saw the Muslim ban, right, when the uh, Trump administration um, took office. Uh, that was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So not all executive orders are, are weighted equally, and not all of them are constitutional, and we definitely see that playing out. Now, as chief legislator, uh, again, the president is going to issue executive orders in terms of trying to carry out uh, the law when Congress doesn't step in to do, to do what the president calls their job. Uh, uh, so we see here uh, President Obama and President Trump signing executive orders. Uh, we've seen uh, 276 of those under the Obama administration. We saw 284 under uh, President uh, George W. Bush, 3,000 of them under the Roosevelt administration. Uh, all of these can be challenged in court. Uh, some of them uh, have been ruled unconstitutional, uh, and there is a back and forth there in terms of checks and balances uh, to make sure that, that the law is constitutionally carried out. Um, but uh, we continue to see the president going back and forth on that. Another way, uh, in addition to executive orders, that the president can basically um, weigh in on issues and the agenda if Congress isn't um, doing what the president wants is the power to veto, uh, the power to say no. Uh, and this is, as we talked about, uh, if, they vet if the president vetoes it, Congress can override it with a two-thirds vote, but that's very hard to do. Uh, the president can also use the pocket veto here, again, that 10 days excluding Sundays, um, in order to uh, just let it sit on the desk and let it die if Congress is out of session and go into full effect if Congress is in session. Now, uh, the president just using the threat of a veto many times can lead Congress to change their mind in terms of how uh, they go about writing a bill. If the president says, I'm hearing from people that Congress is going to do this, and if that's the way they word it, and that's the approach they're taking in this bill, I am going to veto that bill. That has a chilling effect on Capitol Hill, let me tell you, okay? Having worked there, I know uh, if the president says that they're going to veto a bill that hasn't even become a law yet, or hasn't even become a bill to the point that it's going to be going to the White House, uh, and they've already talked about vetoing it, that is not a good sign, okay? Uh, so I guarantee you, uh, members of Congress are going to try and either make the president feel better about the situation or they're going to change the bill uh, because they don't want to go through all that effort and then find out that the president vetoes it, they can't override it, and then the bill dies. Uh, so it is in their interest uh, to try and get that law passed uh, in order to make sure that the president will actually sign the bill, not veto it. And if they are going to veto it, um, that you have enough of the you have enough of Congress in both houses, two thirds, uh, in order to override that veto. And again, that's very rare that uh, that that actually happens. So the line of veto, line item veto, as I mentioned, is something in which it has been declared unconstitutional. Governors have it, um, uh, and and the uh, the president doesn't. It was designed to reduce uh, waste, fraud, and abuse uh, in the system by allowing a president to basically um, uh, pick out and veto the things that they thought were were just wasteful. Uh, and and um, the Supreme Court said that's too much like legislating. If it's wasteful, Congress should take it out, not the president. And that's kind of where it stood ever since then. 
uh, since that time. Uh, a signing statement is uh, an idea. Again, they're signing the bill in the Rose Garden or in the Oval Office. Uh, we've seen President Trump behind the desk uh, signing the bill, and a, oh, there's all people standing around him. Uh, we've seen that before with uh, President uh, Obama as well. Um, this is important because what the president says about this bill really can make a difference. I'm signing this, but you know I'm, I'm hesitant because of blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not a ringing endorsement for the bill. Um, and, and, and sometimes uh, they'll issue veto statements like that too. Well, I'm vetoing this because I think this can be a better bill. I'm sending it back to Congress so that they can either override this if they have the power to, which I don't think they do, or that they can come back with a better bill uh, down the road that can do a better job of addressing X, Y, and Z. Uh, and, um, and those comments do have impact. Uh, they really do have impact uh, in terms of the, uh, the approach that Congress takes in making sure that uh, the that hopefully the president will sign it. Um, and and this uh, signing statement, uh, many times it's just off the cuff remarks the president makes before the press. Uh, sometimes it's a formal statement. Uh, sometimes it is a, a statement released to the to the press by uh, the press office. Um, and um, and again, it, it's information that's going to help Congress uh, in terms of writing legislation that better um, aligns with the president's viewpoint, if that's what they're after. If they're trying to goad the president into uh, to not going that route, then obviously that, that wouldn't necessarily be as successful. Uh, here's a signing statement. Uh, the President Obama signed into a law uh, uh, allowing the tension of citizens um, and uh, which was uh, a statement that he made on that particular uh, signing of that bill. Uh, and we see this, uh, as I said, a, a time and again. Uh, this is H.R. Uh, 4310, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, so the president is talking about the importance of that bill and how it's going to have an impact. Um, all of this, uh, whatever the president says, obviously um, is reported in the media uh, and becomes a major story, especially if it's controversial. Um, and this gets back to Congress, right? So uh, you have tensions with Congress about lawmaking, about uh, appointees, about uh, the uh, the hearings that Congress calls, uh, issues subpoenas uh, to members of the bureaucracy in order to appear for questions and answer sessions with the committees uh, that want to know what's going on in your agency. Um, and all of this tends to create tension, especially if, Cong if Congress and the president are not of the same party. Uh, we see the House that is Democratic. We see the president that is um, Republican. Uh, with the uh, president-elect Biden, we see a Democratic president and a Republican Senate. Um, those create tensions. Uh, how do they work through those in terms of ideologies and agendas that are very different? And if they don't find ways to work together, then you get to the gridlock, the, the partisan um, the partisan gridlock that we see, the frozen tendencies uh, that really don't thaw and nothing gets done for the American people. And that can be very devastating, especially during a global pandemic. You got to find ways to work together. So uh, really important here, another informal power uh, is the, the power to persuade. And this is where the president basically takes his message to the American people through the press, uh, through the media. Because they pay attention to what the president says, uh, the president is going to try and persuade through the American people uh, to persuade Congress, to persuade the Senate, to persuade the House, uh, to persuade uh, the American public uh, to, to buy into his, his plans. Now, if there's a mandate, uh, Biden said he had a mandate uh, because he had the most votes of any president uh, in, in history. 75 million uh, people voted, but it was also a very close election. In a, in a lot of states uh, and, and in the Electoral College. Uh, so uh, that mandate may be different in terms of what we saw when President Obama was reelected or uh, President George W. Bush was reelected, a uh, very different kind of a mandate. And how that plays out in terms of uh, his role with uh, the Senate and their agenda and with the, uh, the House and their agenda is really going to, we're going to take a wait and see approach. But we're also dealing with a pandemic in which uh, the, the stakes are higher and it's a very different type of atmosphere in terms of how that plays out to be continued. We'll, we'll see what happens. All right, executive agreements. I mentioned this idea of international agreements. Uh, the president is working with others. Uh, we have seen um, over the years hundreds of treaties and thousands, tens of thousands of executive agreements playing out. Uh, again, executive agreements only last during the administration. So once that administration leaves office, the executive agreement also leaves with it. 
Okay, uh, so that's really important. It doesn't have Senate confirmation on an executive agreement. It is just between uh, the United States uh, executive branch, uh, essentially on behalf of the United States government and uh, the head of state for the other nation. So whether that is Hamid Karzai there in Afghanistan or whether that's Xi Jinping in China, uh, the idea is the same. Uh, an executive agreement would last for the administration and no longer. Uh, then new administrations would come along wanting new executive agreements uh, and the, the only thing that would last longer than that would be a treaty. And again, you would need Senate confirmation in terms of doing that. So let's talk about some limitations of the president here. The War Powers Act of 1973 was really uh, designed uh, to scale back the power that was given to the president during Vietnam. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was signed um, in, into office uh, in 1964. It was uh, President Lyndon Johnson uh, that... that um, that was the benefactor of this uh, of this resolution, and it basically um, gave it was Congress giving the president power to send troops uh, for uh, an unlimited amount of time uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, in order to protect democracy around the world. Now um, we're not going to get into the conflicts, and and obviously there were there were lots of marches, there was lots of protest uh, around Vietnam. And so, uh, and, and ultimately Vietnam fell, South Vietnam uh, fell to uh, the, the uh, North Vietnamese, and, um, and, and it, the, the country became communist. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, what, was it all worth it? Well, you, you can, you know, weigh that out in terms of, uh, in terms of U.S. history class. But what we want to look at is the, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and its impact uh, on establishing the War Powers Act of 1973, uh, because this was passed by Congress. Um, and again, nine years later, but what we found was um, this was designed to scale back the power of the president in terms of sending those troops. Okay, the framers said you could send troops, uh, but we're not going to let you send them back for as long as you want to. Uh, we're going to limit the amount of time you can send those troops without getting a declaration of war from Congress, without informing Congress of that power, because they worried that Gulf of Tonkin really gave the president a blank check, and they didn't want to do that. They really wanted to dial that back. So the War Powers Act, uh, which, the, of course, the president vetoed and they overrode it anyway, uh, looks at this idea here of uh, the president must notify Congress with Within 48 hours of sending troops into combat, uh, then uh, the president has 60 days uh, to do to um, to complete the mission and bring the troops home. Good luck doing that within 60 days, uh, especially when you're sending troops all around the world, um, unless Congress takes action. Uh, and if they take action, then you can move on in terms of uh, being able to. Um, uh, being able to fund the war, uh, that was an issue with Vietnam. Uh, Congress was cutting off the money. Here are our troops with no resources. Uh, that got a lot of bad press, as you can imagine. Um, and, uh, and major concern, you send troops, uh, you draft troops, you send them into harm's way, and then you don't give them the resources that they need to do the job. Uh, and then you remove the money and the resources uh, while they're there. Uh, so the War Powers Act was really designed to say, hey, Congress and the president need to work together on this, okay? Uh, they need to work together in order to make this happen. Otherwise, it shouldn't be happening, okay? Now, uh, the interesting part about the War Powers Act is it hasn't been constitutionally tested in the Supreme Court. And the reason is uh, because... Uh, uh, traditionally, um, neither the executive branch nor the legislative branch really want to know whether it's constitutional or not. Uh, they're afraid of the answer. Uh, both both branches are afraid of, of the answer and, and what what's at stake there. But the idea of the War Powers Act uh, is to try and place limits on the president in terms of sending troops so that uh, you get Congress to buy into it. Uh, and and if you don't get Congress to buy into it, then um, you don't send troops. Uh, you, you basically keep them at home. Okay, so that's really the the limitations the War Powers Act was designed uh, to uh, to keep the president from just sending troops every which way to every country for every conflict or every uh, disaster without getting Congress to buy in on that. And Congress has the power of the purse, so uh, Congress would approve the budget for that anyway. Uh, the president wouldn't have the power to approve one one dime without Congress's approval, um, and so you're going to need. Congress to buy in on that uh, to whatever conflict you're you're entering into because they're going to have to pay for it in the long run. All right, so uh, we move to another power uh, that has been limited on the president, and that is the power of executive privilege. Uh, this is the idea that the president uh, says that um, 
the people that are closest to me, uh, that are serving as my advisors and my confidants, I'm, I'm sharing very privileged information with them. Uh, sometimes they're matters of national security, and I don't want that to be compromised. So I really want um, that to be covered under executive privilege. You cannot subpoena a person uh, uh, under executive privilege uh, that that is in this capacity to me, to me as president. Because otherwise, if I have no advisors that I can count on and actually talk to uh, about these issues, how am I ever going to get great advice? How am I ever going to get candid, no-nonsense advice about what I should do in those situations? Uh, so this is where uh, executive privilege steps in. Uh, Nixon said everything was covered under executive privilege. Supreme Court said, mm -mm, no way, uh, give us those tapes. And that led to the Watergate scandal, the Watergate Hotel you see down there. Um, this is the role of separation of powers. Uh, it, is, uh, it is looking at executive privilege. And the court has ruled uh, that not everything is privileged. Not everything uh, is covered under executive privilege. Um, it, it, in in the, the U.S. v. Nixon case, uh, the Supreme Court said there is no absolute unqualified presidential privilege of immunity from judicial process under all circumstances. And that was unanimous, ordering Nixon to turn over the tapes. It ultimately led to his resignation. Remember, he was never impeached. He was only, um, he they, they started the impeachment process, but he was never impeached. He resigned before he got there. But what this does tell us, and we've seen this in, under executive privilege, under uh, the uh, the Reagan administration, under the Bush administration, under Clinton administration, um, and uh, when when he was impeached, uh, and we saw this uh, under the Trump administration uh, and the Obama administration. Uh, they've all, uh, at one point or another, claimed executive privilege for people around them. And sometimes the Supreme Court has upheld it, and sometimes they haven't. Uh, so it depends on the situation. It depends on, on what we're talking about. It depends on the severity of the matter. Uh, and it depends on how far is the president going in claiming executive privilege. So the Supreme Court does, in their capacity, really step in in that regard and say, well, you know what? Um, that's not quite uh, what, what the founders meant by executive privilege. Okay, and so um, there is no un absolute unqualified presidential privilege of immunity from judicial process under all circumstances. Uh, the the presidency, uh, the the executive branch really wanted a catch all in terms of hey everything's covered, and they didn't get that. Uh, they didn't get the blank check. Uh, they didn't get uh, they didn't get a, a no, an absolute no either in terms of uh, nothing is covered because uh, some things have withstood that constitutional scrutiny. But uh, the idea there is that um, while not everything is covered, uh, not everything is um, is free from that as well, and that really is the is the point. Okay, so next time uh, we will go to part two in looking at the electoral college. Uh, in part three, we'll look at all the president's staff, and then in part four, we'll look at checks on the president and how that power has expanded uh, over time uh, with the presidency. And I hope you found this useful. I will see you in the electoral college in part two, which is next. Have a great day, and we will see you over at the Electoral College. Don't apply to go there, though.